Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players, uncover their stories, and discover what makes them tick. If you love guitar, music, and the backstory of people's lives, stick around. You're in the right place. Hi, this is Craig. Just want to let you know you can now advertise here on Everyone Loves Guitar podcast. For more information, go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. That's everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber with Everyone Loves Guitar. And my guest today is kind of like the uh, the Jackie Robinson for women of rock and roll, I'd say, right? Uh, I'm with the one and only June Millington and Joan Jett, the Go-Go's, the Bangles. They all owe a debt of gratitude to June. She is a um, singer, songwriter, producer, guitarist, and she also runs a charitable organization called Institute for Musical Arts. June was a co-founder and the lead guitar player of the rock group Fanny. And in 1970, Fanny became the first all-female rock band to release an album on a major label. Between 1970 and 1974, Fanny released four albums, and June has also released three solo records of her own in the 1980s. As I said, June also runs the Institute for Musical Arts, which is an organization she co-founded in 1986 to support women and girls in music and in music-related businesses. She has a book out, her biography, the first of a two-part biography, called Land of a Thousand Bridges, and you can check that out on ima.org. And we'll talk about that and the IMA and June's story today and uh, anything else June wants to talk about. Thanks so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate your time. Absolutely. Hey, so you're- Good to be here. Thank you. Your your first album in 1970 was called Fanny, and I read somewhere or I heard in an interview that you had to record it twice. Yeah, and there's lots of really good reasons for that. Uh, one was that as a band, we didn't know how to record, really. We got to uh, L.A., to Hollywood, as a fully formed band who already knew how to play, how to do a show. In fact, we had our own PA, and we could set that up. Uh, ourselves so we were self-contained we were not formed by a hollywood entity and that's really important to remember um because we started in what well, gene and i started in late 64 um 65 with our first band in high school the Svelts. so we get there and richard perry is our uh, producer and one of the things that happened was unfortunately there was a, a personnel shift and our lead guitar player, Addie, left the band and Gene and Alice turned to me and said, well, now you got to play lead guitar. And I, I was frankly quite frightened because, um, you know, that's a really exposed position. And I hadn't ever set my sights on that. I, I love playing rhythm and I still do. Um, but after freaking out and thinking, thinking about it, I agreed. But then we had to while we had this record deal with Richard, we had to start trying to find a fourth member. And we auditioned a lot of people, uh, a lot of uh, young women. And that took about a year. In the process, we were writing songs and uh, and Richard was trying to develop really his his producer's sound, his sound, and, and getting his skill set together, believe it or not. Because although he'd had a hit with Tiptoe Through the Tulips, remember that one? Yeah, by uh, it's a Tiny Tim. Who, yes, yeah. and that's that's partly why we got signed because that was a novelty hit mm. and reprise figured we would be a novelty act. Oh, so the, wow. The Beatles were signed as a novelty act. Actually, everyone expected it to just last a year. You know, that's why they cut hard days night or they filmed hard days night so quickly because they wanted to make, you know, yeah, they wanted to milk the yeah. milk, the cow while it was ripe. That's exactly right. So wow. that was the approach towards us because obviously we could play and we were attractive. We were uh, completely focused and driven. So that was a plus. So we had to learn how to record and we were looking for our fourth member and it took quite a while. And then uh, when we met Nikki, we did some demos with her and then we got started all over again and recorded uh, what you now hear is the first album. And those demos weren't bad, but you know, when you're, you're, you're getting a band together and you're devel developing a sound. And by the way, we were not the only act on Reprise. And, and, and I will give uh, Reprise uh, a lot of credit. 
for allowing us and Ry Cooter and um, who was that guy who did uh, uh, Short People? Um, Randy, Randy Newman. Randy Newman, yeah. We all three did our first albums twice. <laughs> wow. And yeah, and that was because Reprise recognized that they were presenting something that was unknown to the to the uh, listening audience. But of course, you know, that was a good time. The early 70s was a perfect time to be putting out new stuff as long as it was good mm. and it was merchandised properly. So, you know, I mean, Ry Cooter and, and Randy Newman, you can't go wrong with that. But, you know, think about those Americana horns on Randy's stuff. That had never been on pop hit records. You know, and his voice isn't, you know what I'm saying? I mean, they developed it. And, yeah. Um, and I really give Reprise a lot of credit for that. That's very cool. I didn't realize that yeah. that that's what they had in mind for you, that you would be a novelty act. <laughs> I know. One doesn't think of that. You know, I'm, 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 I just turned 70 in April, and I'm at this age now where I get interviewed a lot by, let's say, high school students or college students for their dissertation. Mm. And one thing that happens is that usually the first questions are framed in such a way that they reference – 1965 as if it were 2018 or 2017 <laughs> and you can't do that you cannot do that because in 1965 there were no references there was nothing to mirror ourselves yeah. to or was being mirrored to us there wasn't there were no all girl bands as far as we knew i mean there were but we didn't know it um you know you walked into a music store and I met Patty Shema last night, you know, two nights ago, the, band, the uh, drummer in Hole, and she, she talked about one of the things that really pissed her off was walking to a store and then, you know, Stu, the drummer, would try to set her straight on a, how to hold the sticks right, you know? So it would be the same thing with guitar players. You would never be taken to go look at electric guitar strings. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, so there are all sorts of uh, areas in which you just absolutely cannot superimpose the 60s or the early uh, 70s on top of where it is now. There, it was like being in a, you know, a dark cave with no <laughs> no flashlight or, or no light at all to, to, to reflect you off the walls. Nothing. You know, I interviewed somebody recently. Do you know Denny Freeman, by any chance, from Austin? No, I don't. He's an Austin player right around, right around your age. And, um, you know, I asked him what was, the, you know, culturally, he said like, 1965, you started having like a few black artists coming in, like you had Chuck Berry, Fats Domino. And he said, three years later, 1968, he goes, the whole world was different. Everybody was walking around with long hair, smoking weed and dropping acid. And it, he said it was almost <laughs> like two different planets. Did you, like, what was your reflection or your, your memory? Was it something similar to that or? Um, it was worse because there was absolutely nothing. I mean, it's hard for people to comprehend. You know, you pick up an electric guitar, or you pick up a guitar at all, you know, and there was no reference for girls being in a band together. So we had to figure out what are the mechanics of that, yeah. you know. So uh, it's a really good thing that Gene and I played ukuleles in the Philippines, and we would sit in front of our radio and, and, and learn songs off the radio. And we love the pop songs that were that were played, Uh that translates so well to pop music because of, you know, the, they're the one, six, four, five in so many cases, right. you know, Neil Sadaka, fantastic calendar girl. I mean, we just love that stuff. This is like, uh, you could probably go on for two hours in this and, and, uh, w talk about the biggest challenges of, you know, you just mentioned there was no frame of reference and you're kind of like, you know, flying without a, or landing without a net. What were the what were some of the challenges, the other challenges about being the first all women rock band musically, business wise, and of course culturally? Well, uh, you know, in in my book, Land of a Thousand Dances, um, uh, actually that's the name of the song, which was named as Land of a Thousand Bridges. Um, uh, by the way, we did La Land of a Thousand Dances so many times. It was a great dance song. So you know, we were in a really good position because. The the uh, yardstick of success for uh, a band in 65, 66, especially all girl, was that would people dance to our music. And that was a great way to learn. But in terms of, you know, obstacles, well, the derision, the ridicule, automatic, automatic. The fact that society was in no way, way geared to encourage or even accept 
the idea, just the idea of an all girl band. So you just went on stage and you knew that it was just going to be um, a blank wall. I mean, you know, in my book, I said, we may as well have said we plan to land on the moon, you know. Yeah. I mean, for girls to say that, oh, yeah, we're going to land on the moon in 68. Don't you know that? You know, um, it would be like that. Just incomprehensible and comprehension, if not outright, uh, you know, basically the pushing back of the parents and the boyfriends didn't understand at all. You know <laughs> that you could call that a problem. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so everything was stacked against you. And one of the things I've remembered uh, lately, just in the last year from doing interviews, is that it was always the boys who came up to us. Now I'm talking about the spelts through Fanny. Sure. Uh, who came up to us to talk. And um, once they got over the shock, all of them, boys or girls, loved us. So that was the interesting double edged sword. First, they kind of automatically hated us. And the second, they realized they were like, you know, moving to the music and hey, these girls are good. They're, ah, oh, they look good and all that kind of stuff. Um, then they would fall in love with us, you know. But it was the boys who come up and say, the opening line was always not bad for chicks, which was a compliment. Yeah. I mean, if somebody said that now, you know, yeah, I don't they, know if I'd actually slap them. But, yeah, you know. yeah. <laughs> um, wow. So, and then the, the girls would just stand there kind of hanging back and the, and the guys would say everything, you know, a lot of them would be trying to pick us up. So we got pretty good at kind of ignoring that or, or <laughs> figuring, figuring out a way to, um, you know, to kind of sidestep it. And then even worse than that, because that's in public and you know, you, if someone's in, has just become a fan that you, you can figure out ways to get, get around a pickup, you know, an automatic sure. pickup. But the problem for me in, in trying to learn guitar, because see, we didn't have much money when we moved here in 61, my dad had been in the U.S. Navy, but he had left the Navy and he uh, wanted to move back. But in order to do that, he needed to change careers. So, um, you know, he he was a systems program uh, engineer and then he became uh, the first systems programmer in California, which was a tough job to do while you're holding down a full time job. In any event, we didn't have any money for guitar lessons and stuff. So. I had to ask people for information. Well, guess what? The only people I could ask for information then was men or boys. And so there was this uh, assumption that I was trying to pick them up or that there would be a favor exchange. So I had to figure out a Holy way. You know, I had to figure out ways to sidestep that. And it was, it was hard. You know, it was almost insurmountable because what do you do? You know, the, 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 uh, you know at the time and even now, I'm so sure that one of your calling cards is sex. So, but you know, I, I, I mean, I know for sure, Gene also, we never did got into music or a, a all girl band or even playing in a band because of sex, drug, drugs and rock and roll. We just wanted to have a friend. We just wanted to make friends. You know, we were, yeah. this, we were like, I was 13 and Gene was 12 when we moved here in 61. You know, we didn't know anybody. Nobody knew where the Philippines was. It was, it was tough. And it's not that we didn't, uh, engage racism in the Philippines. We did, but it was on a whole other level uh, when we moved here. That's amazing. I'm yeah, just trying almost, to. I'm trying to know, process all. I mean, I'm from New York City, yeah. and you know, I've, I've had yeah. grew up with Filipinos and everybody else since yeah. I, you know, always, you know. And I'm just. Well, uh, do you ever yeah. see Filipino women uh, sticking their necks out? No, we're not naturally trained to do no, that. We're no, no, they tend to be. But, yeah, they tend to be more kind of quiet, right? Yeah, very much so. But there's a lot going on. Um, but the, the great thing about having grown up in the Philippines and the Philippine culture is, number one, women really are strong uh, in the culture. The other thing is, uh, because it was uh, basically of the strict Spanish, Catholic, and slash Chinese uh, merchant class that we, we grew up in, we knew how to learn. Also in the schools, you know, the... Learning how to learn was um, part of the curriculum. So once we decided we wanted to learn how to be in a band, boy, we sat down to t take it apart just by learning songs and then teaching it to each other in rehearsal and then going out, say, to a, you know, a high school dance or a, a, an Air Force base was great. Vietnam War was on and, and the guys automatically just loved us. But, yeah. hey, we, we figured out how to do it gig by gig by gig. You know, and it's interesting because 
uh, when Do You Believe, Believe in Magic came out, God, you know, what a great song. And we learned it and uh, people loved it. And then in Fanny, we were opening for John Sebastian often. He, oh, that's and he cool. Was simple at that time. And now he's a friend of mine. And I'm doing the audio book for Land of a Thousand Dances. And I, you know, uh, a lot of times I just make up um, little musical bits just to put behind the narrative. But in one case, I decided I needed to just put a little bit of do you believe in magic? So I recorded it because we have two studios here at IMA and, and I sent it to John. I said, what do you think? Is it okay? And he's like, Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's interesting how life circles, you know? Um, and of course, do you believe in magic was an important song to us. And there you get right back into the rhythm part. You know, now I can play that lead part, but Oh my God, there's no way I could have, um, uh, even thought of approaching. And by the way, Zach, Zach's guitar parts, um, we're we're really phenomenal. I mean, I think he really influenced a lot of us. I'm sitting here just trying to get my head around some of the stuff you're saying, and it's so hard. No, I'm serious. It's like, so I mean, this is what, when you're a kid, you don't have the kind of coping skills ha that you, you know, those are the situations that you were talked about that you were put in yeah. where it's, it, it it's beyond, it's almost like you're invisible. It's even beyond like we were invisible. Yeah, right. It's not almost like we were invisible yeah, how, until we started to do music. How did you? Uh, I know what you're going to ask next, and let me just yeah, cut me off. Paint, and <laughs> yeah, hey, let me paint you just a little picture. You know how how uh, people who are in the military they talk about you know like you don't understand unless you were there in the war and you were in the foxhole and you were taking care of your buddy. Yes. Okay. That's pretty much how it was with me and Jean, because in the Philippines, because we experienced racism, we were already in a foxhole without talking about it. We actually have never talked too much about all the pain. You know, we just had to get through it. So we had each other's back. So we were always learning everything together. And we were in that foxhole. And um, everybody else who was ever in the spelts, um, and then even leading it to Fanny, like our guitar player quit, you know, right away, came in and out. But it was always me and Gene. So we definitely have that foxhole mentality where you just, boy, you just do it. You know, you're down to your last bullet, but you're hanging on. Yeah. You know, and that last bullet metaphor actually really works because there were a number of times where, you know, we, we almost didn't go to the troubadour and and. and play at open hoot night and you know be discovered by richard perry's secretary who i'm still in touch with now that's really um, cool and it's you know almost when Addie left i mean really i was gonna play lead guitar it just seemed impossible i mean just the last bullet and just you just grit your teeth and you make it to the next dawn and boy you just get back down to work and that's really that's really the secret to our success aside from our talent of course you know, you just put your head down and you kept working. You, we kept working. And, yeah. you know, and, and actually the metaphor of bullets whizzing by is not that far off because, you know, society was really going to try to kill us. It didn't want these girls poking their heads up and going, hey, listen to us. This is groovy, isn't it? You know, that's why badge is so important to us, because um, for some reason, the lyrics to that song spoke to us as. Uh, young women singing, believe it or not. Yes, I told you that, you know. Yeah, yeah cream song. It's, it's, yeah, it was our, yeah, well, that was on the first album. And I still have people tell me that they think that my lead guitar solo on, on Badge, our version of Badge, is as good or better than uh, Eric Clapton's. And you know what? It's like, well, <laughs> I hear that, but, you yeah, know, yeah. I... I played my ass off. And there's one note that when I hear that now, I hear this one note. Uh, it's, I think it's the, on the follow-up line to the lead guitar, the lead uh, section itself. But there's this one note that if you listen to it carefully, you can feel that as a cry of anguish. And I'm like, oh, my God, come on, give me a chance, you know. And you got to realize that I went from zero to 100 miles an hour. Yeah. Um, in the space of a year, because I did not play lead guitar. And at the end of that year, there I was doing that solo. And who was hanging out in the studio with us? Lowell George, who, who had become one of my best friends. He didn't teach me how to do that solo, but he taught me a lot, you know, a lot about 
technique and and uh starting from a certain point and building up and and skunk baxter did the same thing for me they were great friends what did you do to like <laughs> join joined us in the foxhole sorry no no it's all good what did you do yeah. was there anything like that you guys did to relieve pressure like to because it sounds like you're under a tremendous amount of pressure and i know when you have a work ethic like that i would imagine on top of the pressure from all the bullshit external you're probably driving yourself crazy to become the the lead guitarist whatever the bar you set well, the music itself, you know, really, yeah. you know, because when we, it, it's a drug, music itself is, yeah. is I think, just the best sure. high ever. So I really can't point to that much else. I mean, we went to other people's gigs and we went to parties or whatnot, but it wasn't, they were always wanting to get back to work because that was what made us feel good. Yeah. Wow. You, uh, you open for a lot of great artists, you know, people like Johnny Winter, Edgar, Humble Pie, Staples Singers, Dr. John Rush. Can you share maybe a few cooler, interesting stories about working with any of these guys or acts that you open or perform with? Well, of course, uh, we loved all those acts. And in particular, I loved um, the Staples Singers because I, I recognized, you know, what Mavis was all about. Dr. John, um, I was a fan of his already because of uh, the, the the song Walk on Gilded Splinters. You know that song from the album Greek no, I don't know that. Oh, you must hear that. It's yeah, incredible. It's kind of voodoo. So um, I was already a huge fan, and I loved his act. I mean, not only was the music great, but he had on that headdress, yeah. that feather, and he was Dr. John, the night tripper. Yeah, yeah. And he actually talked like that, <laughs> you know? Um, and he was really nice to us. Now, the thing I noticed was that the better the act, the nicer they were to us, you know? So... There was one gig, I think it was with Johnny Winter, it was probably Texas or something, and he found out i just got my Les Paul, you know, so he bounded up next to me, wanted to play my Les Paul, check it out and all that. So there were there were these camaraderie-filled moments where you felt like, yeah, you were on the same, you know, the same plane. Sonny and Cher, we were on the first Sonny and Cher show, and Cher wanted to meet us. She sent Sonny to our dressing room and uh, brought us backstage. Um, uh, you know... To me, the moments that were the best was was when somebody was really nice to us because we could hold our own pretty much with anybody on any stage. I mean, it got to the point where it didn't matter who it was. And they were probably watching us from the side of the stage going, oh, my God. <laughs> um, so the music community was pretty – it was just like, quote, society. The music community was totally fine and accepting you for the most part. I think for the most part, but also on top of that, um, Richard and our management company, Blue Peacock, had a great uh, plan, which they and we carried out, which is um, as we were recording the first album, we really were at this house that we called Fanny Hill, and it was just up the hill from Chateau Marmont. So it was a house that Hedy Lamar had. It was like Hedy Lamar's house, one of her houses. So I didn't realize at the time how electric she was. And I can tell you the energy in that house crackled. Um, and what management Richard did was they brought over executives a few at a time for a private lunch slash little playing session. And we would play for, you know, a private party for, for like, you know, half hour, 45 minutes. And these guys got really turned on really turned out i'm talking about everyone at the record company who you know wasn't in, in a position to merchandise market talk about us and so on um and so the record company itself was behind us they weren't afraid because they had seen us in our basement playing for them privately and they got the hit they got the hit so it was <laughs> just it was everybody else that's i'm it it, it amazes me how different women were in general back then out because i would have thought the women would have came over and s supported you but like you said it wasn't it was always the guys yeah but what women women didn't step out that's the thing yeah. you gotta think about the si society as it was now we did meet the band bertha um and i don't remember how we met them uh, but we used to go to their gigs and go to the beach with them and you know so there was as far as i was concerned no friction because i was a huge fan bertha was amazing you know and uh it's just that there just wasn't anybody else around on the horizon and 
any women who came over were were welcome, but there just weren't that many. I mean, look, the first time that Bonnie Raitt came to L.A., um, she she called me and asked if she could stay at Fanny Hill, and I said yes. So she stayed in Jean's room downstairs, which did have its own kind of private entrance if you went through the window. So actually, I find out now, she said, you, you don't even know what went on. <laughs> <laughs> so that was one woman who whom I was close with and whom we could give a room to, you know, when she came to LA and the way that I, or we met her was, I remember we were doing a gig in Austin and we did our first set and it was a pack. What was the name of the hall? Great hall. We played there quite a few times. And, uh, during the break, our, our road manager, Mark Hammerman said, um, there's somebody who wants to meet you. But I mean, it's really unusual that they'd let anyone in backstage, especially between sets. So it just so happened that that afternoon, right after the sound check, I was hanging out a little bit and I heard this amazing music coming through the PA. And I, I said, who's that? And the guy says, oh, it's, it's this new, you know, probably said this new chick or something, this Mm -hmm. new artist, Bonnie Raitt. And I went, I just went in my head. I thought, boy, I got to remember this. And that night she's brought into the dressing room and she walks in with like two or three guys. And just with that drawl of hers and that confidence smile, hi, I'm Bonnie Ray, blah, 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 blah. And so, you know, in the book, I I talk about it as, you know, imagine that you're two people walking on the Andes and you're the only two people who, who, you know, know something about each other and you meet each other in the clouds. That's what it was like for me. She was the only other woman uh, guitar player who whom I became friends with and whom we acknowledged to each other that we were, you know, we were sort of more or less on the same level in, in the sense of who we were, how we understood we were in the universe and where we were each going, that we had a mission. And that was unusual. Did but that's got, it. Did you guys keep that's in contact? It. Back, did you guys periodically, you know, check in back in the day or? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. We check in now. She's she's on the uh, she's on the uh, advisory board of IMA. In fact, she's the second person who joined. And it was we hadn't even gotten our 501c3 when I asked her to be on the advisory board. She said, oh, yeah, right away. And, and it was backstage in Berkeley at the That's... Berkeley Bowl. And I said, well, will you write something for us? And she just sat down right there in the dressing room and tore off a piece of paper and wrote something that we still use today, which is IMA is an idea whose time has come. That's awesome. I actually interviewed a you know, guitar player now, George Marinelli. No. Yeah. I, I interviewed him quite a while back. A lot of guys have played for the, I've actually met. I probably know him and I just, I'm so bad at names. So <laughs> you left Fanny in 73. What was the reason that you left? Um, you know, it's so complicated. My personal life was really screwed up. And, um, you know, like I said, it was like being in a foxhole. And on top of that, I was point, you know, I was a point person, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. Of the patrol because I was lead guitar and, um, I took a lot of pot shots. So I, you know, I was, I was tired. I was tired of this being the first question in every interview directed at, at me during a Fanny interview, which was, how does it feel like to be a girl guitar player? I thought, uh, how is it? Do they all know this question? Do they talk to each other? <laughs> so um, that wow. coupled with the fact that we'd already done four albums and we knew there were hits in there, but we never got that top 30 hit that people would still be talking about now and referencing. And, you know, remember, Fanny, that song that they did, you know, that never happened. What, and what? I think in my, I was just so tired and, it was sort of like, you know, we, we were successful, but we were all, always on the lip of success. I mean, we'd recorded at Apple Studios. We knew uh, at the time we'd met every Beatle except for, for um, John. Uh, I met him later. But, excuse me, but it was just, it had slowly dawned on us that we were doing gig after gig and rehearsing and writing and, and, and society just wouldn't give us that hit. It just wasn't ready. You know, but now I go a step further and I say, really, what we were trying to do was intelligent rock, you know, because when you look at the hit songs that, uh, you know, women or all girl bands had uh, the first hits after that, they're pretty much 
uh, pretty starkly about sex or something that's not yeah, you know bu- bubblegum ish. Yeah, and really we were we were uh, doing intelligent rock. I mean that was really our approach. You know, it's pretty. You know, even on the first album, I mean Nikki's song "Bitter Wine" and and Gene's intro bass line to that is just it's incredible. You know. Um, the song is incredible, and I describe it in the book as you know, it's almost like we had been together in another lifetime, and we were on our our horses with our standard, you know, uh, beers, like going into battle or whatever. It's just a scene. That song, if you listen to it carefully, it's it sets something that's old. It's old, man. We we were meant to do this, and place in the country and i wrote a song called thinking of you and and, you know we all wrote songs together soul child they're really good lyrics but the audience really wanted to just hear i don't know something else that they could that they could admit into their you know their their uh brain scan you know scanning what what am i gonna let in (laughs) so it sounds like with you because I'm, I'm not going to lie and say I know every Fanny catalog, but I did a lot of listening to your stuff in preparation mm-hmm. of this, and I know you're all extremely proficient musicians, really talented. You had, you had a great guitar tone, um, and your music was cool, really cool. And so basically, you're pretty convinced that this the world was not ready to allow a female rock band to sit on top of the, the charts or even get into the charts. Yeah, it was just um, they just wouldn't melt enough. Enough people fell in love with us, and I get I get emails or or you know posts notes on Facebook and whatnot saying. I mean, it's almost like you remember where you were when Kennedy was shot. You know, yeah. a lot of people remember where they were standing and what was going on the first time they heard Fanny. Yeah. You know, it was that earth shaking. Um, but it wasn't enough. The time just needed a couple of more years, and I didn't have the strength. Quite frankly, I, I didn't have the strength. I fell apart, and it was not due to drugs. I mean, I was a vegetarian. I was doing yoga. I read Chinese poetry. Now, I won't say that I didn't inhale. I mean, that'd be crazy. We're talking about <laughs> into the seventies. So I'm not going to lie. Uh, but you may not know, this, but I don't have hearing in one ear, and oh, I don't wow. have equilibrium on that side either. So. My my body and my brain is hard, hardwired differently and works in time and space differently. Wow. So I just can't do that many drugs. That's the bottom line. I can't really go off and drink a whole lot and then, I don't know, take a toke of this, take a toke of that. Just sure. never I, I have been able to do things, uh, you know, independent of each other, try them out, go, oh, this is fun, but I can't, I can't overdo it. So that's a really good thing, I think, in yeah. this life. I was meant to have a, a kind of a strict <laughs> body time space situation that would allow me to grow and be talking to you at the age of 70 in two or three months, you know, pretty incredible. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, you need to figure out, tell everybody what the, what you're doing, because you <laughs> look, that's what you should be selling your, you, you know, know, what Filipino ancient secrets yeah. of aging. Yeah. Or you know, I'm a Buddhist. Number one. So I've, you know, I've gotten great teachings from, believe it or not, the Dalai Lama before he got his Nobel peace prize, you could actually get close to him and get teachings. Um, Ruth Den- Denison, Vipassana, but also I get enough sleep. Mm. I make sure I get enough sleep because if I don't, I get dizzy. That's the thing is I have this, you know, early warning system that's yeah. in my body. So I have to get in a sleep or I, it, there's no point. And, and I can't even pretend I'm okay. So, and I know that most people are sleep deprived. Yeah, totally. So I, I will say that getting enough sleep. Well, now that I'm older, I take, you know, I, I always wonder my, why my mom would fall asleep in the different, in the midst of a conversation. That she, <laughs> that's, you know, I don't do that during conversations, but I do it between, you know, doing things like, Three times a day, I'll lie down. I never would consider that in my 20s. Oh, my God, how boring could that be? Right. But, you know, we have two recording studios here at IMA, which is 20 minutes from Smith College. Think of it that way in the five college area of, of um, Northampton in Massachusetts. And so I'm doing, like I said, I'm doing the audio book to Land of a Thousand Bridges. So I'll go out there and I'll get to the barn, into the recording studio, and I'll work for an hour or two or all night or whatever. Then I'll make sure I lie down. Yeah. And then I can do my next thing, which is like doing this or answering mail or whatever. You sure. know, that's really important. Give your mind some rest. 
Yeah, I think you're right. I would like to get some more sleep. I don't need that much. God. Dude. <laughs> the June Millington way. Yeah. The way it's That's it. I think I think this is the package, the June yeah. Millington way. I I could see this. You got skin cream, you have some, you know, audio tapes that where you get people asleep. Um, we'll have this down by the end of the conversation. Eat avocado, coconuts, you know, well, spend time in the trees. Absolutely, yeah. And then you have a pilgrimage up to IMA. You know, and we're going to start selling pajamas. I think this uh, this Christmas because I love working in my pajamas. I'm in pajamas right now. I saw you in a video. Yes, sorry, nice. I saw you in a video. Yes, you. She is in pajamas. Yeah, that's so funny. My God. So you know, and a lot of people get a kick out of that. And I know that the the girls at camps would also like it because I think the first one we're going to do is exploding heads. And let me just tell you why. When we do our rock and roll girls camps, I do the afternoon session called um, Music as a Second Language. And in order to do that, I have to talk about four mothers, the women who came before. Mm -hmm. And like, what is music? Why do we even bother with the scale and organize? You know, that all has to do with Pythagoras, etc. Then I get into chords and I get into keys and I start getting into where's the one and, and I can see their heads explode. And so heads so I, exploding, yeah, yeah. You know, their heads just, you know, after a certain amount of of uh, information, I have to get them up on their feet and you know moving around. Maybe we'll play some Motown and they can dance. Of course, a foremother's Motown, like you know Martha and the Vandellas. So um, and people really, they really like the idea that I wear pajamas a lot. I even wear them during camp. <laughs> Hey, because, you're, you're you 70. <laughs> you're, you're June Millington and you're 70. You could do whatever the hell you want. You know, you know that's that, it. That, <laughs> don't try to stop me. No, seriously. Like, you know, it's like, who, yeah. you know, whatever. Right. <laughs> no, so, I mean, I mean, like I'm 54 and I, I like, that's how I've felt like in the last three, four years, not at others expense, but I'm like, you know, I feel comfortable doing this and I don't need to justify it and I don't need to explain yeah. it and I'm not hurting anybody and it's not an anybody's expense. Great. That's it. End that's the conversation, right. you know, that's right. And then you got music on top of it, which is the perfect car carpet ride. Yeah, totally. Let me ask you a question, June. If you could go back and like maybe give yourself advice to, to young June Millington, if you had been open to it, what would you have liked to hear that would have benefited you? Well, you know, interestingly enough, I think I was hearing it because I have a lot of angels and spirit guides who, who really guide me and I hear them. Um, like IMA was founded because I was hearing them say, hey, somebody's got to take care of these you know, young girls coming up or they'd come into my dreams. So I think that I already knew um, the answer to that, which is don't give up, you know, just keep working, uh, meet the opportunities, meet the, the uh, you know, there's, there's the, these slices of time where you actually have a chance to learn something or have a chance to um, realize that tomorrow's another day, you know. So you're going to be discouraged, but tomorrow is another day. You can learn another drum beat. You can, you know, land on the one in that way that just makes you one with the universe. You know, so it's getting down to those almost like the center of the nucleus, super details that I love. I love landing there where there's almost no thought. But in order to get there, you got to do that practice thing where your head explodes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's always that's so, everything. Yeah, somehow I already knew that. Um, I'm extremely focused. Boy, it is hard to get me off the rails. Once I get an idea of that I'm going to do something, you know, I pretty much stick to it. And if if you or if I do a life review, I pretty much see that that's played out. It has not been easy, but it has played out. So don't lose heart. You know, remember that tomorrow's another day. Just keep at it. If it's what you love and it feeds you, well, number one, you got to see what feeds you. Yeah. You know, if it's music, okay, great. Then I can talk to you, but it could be anything, right? Yeah. Thanks. Um, I mentioned earlier, your tone is great. And to me, it's like the classic British brown sound. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have, I still have my brown, my brown fender. Tweet yeah. amp here. <sighs> great. Um, <laughs> Is that just you? Like, how did you get that? Was that just a Gibson through a Marshall or Gibson through a Fender? What was that? Like, what oh, did it's you Fender. Do? It's Fender. And it's, I, I had Gibson. I had Gretsch. I had a Gretsch uh, ES355. 
because, you know, the Beatles, I like the Beatles stuff. So essentially, the first rig actually that I got was I walked to a pawn, pawn shop in Sacramento with my dad on a Sunday. And we bought that, that uh, little Sears rig. Mm-hmm. I, I don't even have a picture of it. What was it? A silver tone amp and a little. Yeah. Silver I mean, tone. I think it was or, or a harmony or a silver tone. Yeah. Something like that. So, and it was hard to play. Those things are like battle axes, but you know what? <laughs> it was mine. I think he spent $50 on the rig, you know, That's and that lot. was a lot of money yeah. for him. So my That's dad probably like, 500 bucks or 600 bucks today for, for a first oh, guitar. That's a great. Yeah. 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 So pawn shop. And uh, I remember it was like, you know, it was uh, one of those days it was winter and there was kind of like fog in the air, which I hate cause you know, from the Philippines, but we did that long walk. We found it and I had that rig and then the Beatles, well, they had the, the Vox amp and the, uh, you know, I think he, he played a, uh, what was it? Uh, a Gretsch Countryman. Yeah. So I got a, Gret- a Gretsch Countryman. And for some reason, I, why did I move away from that? Because, oh, yes, because, by the way, being in Hollywood and being so close to the Whiskey A Go-Go, where we also did a lot of gigs, I got to see a lot of people and we played with a lot of bands. So one of the bands we played with, I met Kent Henry, who was playing that Les Paul guitar that I eventually bought that 57 Les Paul and he became the replacement guitar player in Steppenwolf. So we did a couple of festivals with him and I'm on the road. I'm in New York with Fanny and he calls me up and he, he just was, Oh my God, I'll never forget the sound of his voice. He begged me to buy the, his Les Paul for $500. He was in a jam. Cause he did, he needed the money. I couldn't believe it. And I didn't want it, you know? And, um, <laughs> he, so I said, look, um, the the best I could do to just give him some hope was I said, well, I'll talk to our road manager. I'll ask him to ask our accountant if it's okay if we buy it. And uh, that's what happened. That's how I got that uh, Les Paul. Now, I can't say that that Les Paul is my sound, but it is the one that I'm, I'm incredibly comfortable with. And it's my friend. And so I just do have to mention Lowell and uh, Lowell George and Skunk Baxter really showed me how to slow down. And uh, have a marriage between your guitar and your amp. So whatever you're you're going to plug into, you got to check out all the settings. You got to slow down and just you know get into every single move that you make. You know, so every split second is important to me. I I, I can't play fast. I so you know I don't really try to play fast that much. But the tone you you zeroed right in on it. The tone is. Yeah, is where it's at. But it really is you're getting inside with the wood and the wire of, of the guitar, all the pickups, checking out, you know, different balances. And then you got to get your amp in there, you know, and I, I see them as living entities. They're not separate for me, yeah, you know, yeah. we're all one. So, and also when I got to LA um, or when we got to LA, so that would have been mid 68, I saw some guy playing at a club, and I wish I could remember his name. I remember he was kind of tall and lanky and really nice, and I asked him if he would show me something, give me like a guitar lesson. Do you know he came over to Fanny Hill, and he sat with me for about an hour, and he showed me a couple of things, which was like gold. I still use them today. Yeah, and you want to know what they are? Hmm. He showed me a couple of exercises on the neck where you take your four fingers and the game is that the four fingers starting from first position, you put your four fingers over four frets. So you have a playing field of four flat frets and slowly first finger, second finger, third, fourth, you notice what's going on. I mean, and then now you can really notice your fingers um, jumping around and not, you're not having control. So that's where I learned control. One, two, three, four, next string. One, two, three, four, and do it really slowly. Get up to the top, slide up. Now you do it the opposite way. And I show that to Gene too, and we both still do that today, you know, before we play. And also he hit me to playing with a small pick. So in Fanny, I played with a small pick, believe it or not, and a little finger pick on my little finger. Which on your I got, little finger? Yeah, I got out of the ha- habit of, of doing that, but that was kind of like, my secret that's really mm-hmm. cool that 50 yeah, so i had control you know i had control with my right hand and i had this 
uh, four fingers on the four fret playing field deal, which is, it may sound like not such a big deal, but it really is the secret to the whole thing. No, let me, no let me tell you, I've interviewed several other players that there, they had an early teacher that taught them that. And they said every day when I pick up my guitar, that's the first yeah. thing I do still today. So yeah. that's totally, you know, a lot of people do that, you know? So I totally agree. And the, the melting pot of the United States, uh, rock and roll, funk, and all the stuff that was being made up that we now think of as classic rock was being experimented on in Hollywood and L.A. in those years. Yeah. You know, there was Hollywood, there was New York, there was Muscle Shoals, Nashville, you know. Yeah, Detroit probably too. Oh, yeah. Uh, right, right. Yeah. You're 57. That has P90s in it. Is that correct? No, it's the original. It's the PAFs? Whatever the originals were. See, I'm I'm terrible to talk to. See, you know who you should talk to is Skunk Baxter because he was my guitar repairman. Hey, if you turn me on to Skunk, I'll come up and clean the IMA for a day. <laughs> Let me tell you. <laughs> All right, I'll do that. Um, um, but they're the original pickups. They are the original pickups. The only thing I did because the whammy bar, I just never got into it because – it is hard enough to keep that G string in tune. You know, the intonation oh. on on, uh, on those uh, Gibsons is really a tough. You got to wrestle it down every day. You know, yeah. so and I the I, I can do it with my fingers. Whatever I want. Oh yeah, and that that first guy who gave me that lesson that when we first moved to LA, he also showed me how it's all in the wrist in terms of the the vibrato, and it really is. And I practiced hundreds of hours just. You know, going up, going down, slow, fast, you know, whatever. So with that, I mean, I, I really, I have, to, I have to say that I got more into the inside of every movement from my hand and what I'm hearing in my one ear or my hands, plural, and what I'm hearing in my one ear, rather than even knowing how many frets were on each guitar because I have so many guitars or what the pickups, pickups are. I'm the worst sure. person in the world. To talk to, I, I I kind of focus in on another level. I gotta say, it really is another level. I'm kind of floating, you know. <laughs> hey, whatever makes you happy, you know. That's, that's all it's about. To be honest, yeah, with you. that's what makes me happy. I just get in there because, to tell you the truth, every time I pick up a guitar, I feel like I don't know anything. I know nothing. Yeah, and yeah. I got to somehow get to where the center is, you know. Uh, let it come to me, so I'm its instrument, you know. But I don't feel like I know anything. And then I just let it start speaking, and that's where, where my connection is. You have some really cool vintage guitars. Can you talk about some of your other ones besides the 57? Yeah, I've got a, a Strat that when we first on the road went on the road with Fanny, I saw, and this is back in the day when I actually looked at ads and little papers, <laughs> I saw an ad for a Strat, and I asked, um, I asked uh, to be taken to this little trailer where this young boy lived with his mom and he needed to sell this strat. And I, I can't, I think it was $125 or something. I had how many paints it had uh, house paint on it. I had, I think it had six layers of house paint. Oh my God. And I had this idea. I just had this vision where I wanted a guitar that was just down to its natural wood. And that's, that's what one of our roadies did. They <laughs> sanded it all down. Yeah, and then just put a, uh, a coat of lacquer. So uh, when I first went to Skunk, which, by the way, was Lowell who turned me on to Skunk, um, he he was the guy who set the whole thing up. And that Les, the Les Paul, he put the master volume control on. Now, that is the key, by yeah, the way. Yeah, I've heard so that. So I can use of... that in so many ways. And also on the Strat, he said, hey, let me put on bass, bass, um, uh, bass frets on this because you, you're going to be able to move faster. And I was... I was kind of not into it, but after all, he is skunk, and he's so. But you oh, talk about so- you got, between Lowell George and skunk. Oh my <laughs> God! I mean, I mean, it was like hitting the the guitar lottery. I mean, yeah, you man, know, we hit the ground running. We hit the holy ground crap! Yeah, definitely. You know, talk and about- he so he put those bass frets on, and wow, um, it really is. It's it's very smooth. And then when we did the album with um, um. 
Todd Rundgren, the last mm. Fanny album I was on, he wanted to buy that guitar for me. And I just looked at him. I was like, I couldn't comprehend that he was asking me if I would give up that guitar. Yeah. You know, I had nothing to say. It's just like, no. I mean, what, well, you want me to slip my wrist and just give you a cup of blood? It's the same thing. That's right. Was that recorded at Bearsville? Did you do that at Bearsville? No, no, no. It was um, in New York, um, Moogie Klingman's uh, studio. What was the name of that? I forget. But it was uh, um, in the village, okay. basically. Yeah. Upper East Side or something like that. Yeah. So you got your Strat, your 57 Les Paul. Any other cool vintage ones? Oh, man, I have so many guitars. Um, Vintage, vintage, vintage. And, and pick uh, one that's got a good story with it, if you have one, of how mm, you got it. How I got it? Yeah. If Boy. You have one. Isn't that funny that my head just, you know, I got a couple of uh, Gretsch guitars not so long ago um, that are amazing. And they, they have this thing where I like, I like guitars that um, they have a workmanlike quality to, to them. You know, like they'll take a lot of abuse because I, I hit it hard on rhythm, mm -hmm. but then I want them to sing for me when, when we switch to one line stuff, you know? Sure. So I, I love those guitars, but there's one that was given to me by a woman who um, who has donated a lot of stuff to IMA. She's got money and she has collections, and it's a, a Sonics. Do you know that that guitar? It's not made out oh. of wood. It's made out of some kind of a polymer, and it was made for well, uh, working working guys. I mean, it was the working person's guitar that was under five hundred bucks. And when did they make them? Um, I'm, I'm just going to make a guess. Mid 70s into the 80s or something like that. Sonics. And it is a great rock guitar. Great rock guitar. So I love that one. I have one that was a prototype of from Alembic. There was a woman who was living next to us at IMA West in Bodega. And she worked for Alembic. And she was making, okay, listen to this. She was making a guitar that was balanced for women, made for women. Because you know what? Wow, that's the pretty problem, clever. Yeah. The problem with guitars is that they're not made for breasts. Yeah. That's the problem. I don't like that. But I work around it, you know. And that guitar you know has what? a That's a great shape. idea. Yeah, and it's balanced in a different way. Sure. So she brought it over. She's living next to her. She brought it over to me to check out. And I never was able to let, let it go. I mean, I was doing uh, gigs with Chris Williamson and Trent Fury at the time, so I went on the road with it. So what I... I worked out a deal with her where every time I did a gig, I sent her some money. You know, oh, okay, cool. It is a great guitar. It's 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 got those clean pickups. Now, don't ask me what I could find out, but it's just I'll send you a photo. I'll send you a photo. You have a cool. I've seen you on uh, like playing a white Les Paul. It looks like. No, no, it's a D'Angelico. Oh, this it's a really nice looking guitar. Well, I got that through. Uh, through the Angelica because Skunk uh, made made a play for me um, because uh, Fanny Walked to the Earth played at the She Rocks Awards at sure. NAMM this sure. year and I, I don't want to fly with my Les Paul anymore so basically <laughs> I actually don't want to fly with any of my guitars but yeah. you know um, so I was talking to Skunk and he said oh well let me let me see if I can blah 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 and I went to uh, AES in New York and I went to the D'Angelico uh showroom and they're downtown like, in manhattan aren't they yeah right yeah. and um and that guitar just spoke to me and they gave it to me to play at nam uh play at the she, she rocks, rocks. yeah that's very cool yeah i like I like that guitar yeah it's great oh uh, there's yeah there's so many guitars i have a t5 it's an electric acoustic mm -hmm. do you know that no i don't oh my gosh uh um a t5 made by a tailor and I have an acoustic guitar of theirs because I saw another great guitar player from South America playing one. And it's also smaller and it's great for women. Uh, what is it? A, a C113 or something like that. I can send you a list and photos, you know, because I'm in love with my guitars, but I'm, I'm terrible. I just don't remember that much. You know, I, I, I'm kind of, I understand that because it's about the feeling. It really is. You know, I get it. Because like... I have so many people I talk to and I feel bad sometimes. I can't remember. Like if they're they're in town and I'll come <laughs> see them and they'll invite us or we'll go out 
to grab a bite to eat or a drink or something. And I feel bad. Yeah. Sometimes I don't remember the specifics of the stories, but I always remember the feeling. Right. Not that right. guitars are like people, but I mean, it's that's what I think counts anyway. Well, it's beyond that. Guitars have their own soul, their own spirit. I yeah. mean, and I, you know, I always say that I, I don't play a guitar. It plays me. Yeah, so I like that. So once it's playing me, there I go. I'm owned by the guitar. And so I would never let my Strat go, for example. Never. I mean, um, they are they are ancients who speak through me. I get, totally and it's a get very that. spiritual connection. Hey, this will be interesting. Desert Island Discs. <laughs> pick, pick just for today top three no particular order i know tomorrow could be three different ones and the same thing next day but what would you, what's your knee-jerk reaction well the first one has got to be laura nero's 13th uh, eli and the 13th confession unbelievable i mean i listened to that album every night for a year i went to sleep to that album so eli's 13th confession uh laura nero what an effect she had on me um Sergeant Pepper's got to be in there because uh, not only was it the right time, but all the sounds and, and what they were talking about, what they were singing about. So, so unbelievably creative. And, uh, well, you got to have Are You Experienced in there and Aretha somehow. We're going to have to split that one. Oh, and Stevie, <laughs> Stevie, Stevie, Talking Book, Inner Visions. I mean, those three have got to be, they've got to split the third position. <laughs> <laughs> we'll give you a pass for today. Thank you. <laughs> I will let you do that. Baby, Thanks. Baby, sweet baby. <laughs> there you go. Hey, um, what's the what's the, the, the some of the most important things you've learned about yourself throughout you know your whole journey uh, of of music and life? I guess really to dig deep, to dive deep. I think that is the place that provides me the most solace. Because when I didn't know anything, when I was just a kid in the Philippines and, and you know, Gene and I felt so hurt because we didn't really have any friends and like that, it took me to a place where I had to, to you know, dive, 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 submerge under the waves and find out what was really going on. And I think that would be it, you know, the, the, the diving deep and uh, learning how to hold your breath till finally you don't even need the breath anymore because you're there. How come you had such loneliness in the Philippines? Biracial. Oh. Biracial. My mom's Filipina, and we grew up in the Philippine culture. And it was pretty good till we got to the American school in first grade. And then, uh, you know, they were all white kids for the most part, almost all okay. white. And they had their noses up in the air, let me tell you. It's wow. horrible. So music, music. I mean, and, and of course, I was born right after World War II. So there I saw the bomb craters and we heard all the stories. You know, it was really horrible. So rock and roll was so great because you know what? In rock and roll, you can you can make your own frame and then step into it and make yeah. yourself up. And then then you have to actually live through becoming that and then going beyond. You know, So that's my life journey was, first of all, finding that frame. So fortunately, Gene and I shared that spot. And we were able to just, you know, have that camaraderie and understand what we were doing, you know, that we were heading for something that was bigger than us, that we fully wanted to to join in whatever was bigger, bigger than us, you know, because it was not we weren't happy where we were. Um, and and then and riding that wave, you know, magic. I still love magic carpet ride because that's how I feel about music. And by the way, my last Paul played Mar magic carpet rides. I don't know how many times it had to be scores of times. So nice connection there. That's awesome. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, most important thing your dad taught you. Well, I remember once I was having a math problem and uh, in high school and he was, he was a math wizard and he sat me down. And he said, look, just separate it into manageable chunks. And that was incredibly valuable because when you, for example, when you're trying to leave, to learn lead guitar, I always broke it down in manageable chunks. And, you know, are you going up the neck? Are you going down the neck? How, what position? I mean, how are you going to make this transition between this note and that note? So I do slow everything down once I have a concept so that I can figure out where am I going. I know a lot of people just do it on the fly. They get so good at jamming and everything. They can just kind of 
do that. And I do that to a certain extent, but basically breaking it down to manageable chunks is, is the most profound thing my dad ever taught me. And I think that's a great way to solve almost any problem, musical yep. or anything, you know, relationship, right. work, right. business. I mean, yeah. it's so much easier to digest and it's less overwhelming and yep. you get your hands on it. Yeah, that's great advice. And how about your mom? Most important thing she taught you? I just think unconditional love. You know, she loved the children so much. And by the way, she is the one who went with us to the music store and signed for all the equipment for the Svelts. Uh, we talked to wow. both our mom and dad about it. And my dad said, well, we can't afford that, you know. And, uh, and he said, well, who's going to take care of you? Meaning if we became musicians, you know, would we get married and be taken care of? That's so <laughs> yeah, funny. Point, as it turned out. But um, so my mom went to the music store and she behind his back signed for everything about like $500 worth of stuff. Like we're talking 1965. You know? Wow. Yeah. That was so really that, cool. Yeah. Our PA, our first electric bass, my second electric guitar, uh, and a bigger amp. <laughs> that was really cool, your mom, to do that. Yeah. And so if it weren't for our mother, we, we, we would not have the Svelts, Fanny. You know, I wouldn't be here talking to you. So, you have any, uh, I think you kind of do. You have any non musical superpowers? Uh, I'm told I'm able to disappear, like just disappear. Like, <laughs> What do you mean? Um, well, <laughs> you know, since I'm deaf in one ear, I, um, growing up, I'm, I mean, I didn't know I was deaf till I was 13, hmm. okay, when we moved here from the States to the States. And I didn't know I don't have equilibrium on that side either until I was like after Fanny. Like That's got to be really tough. The well, equilibrium it was thing. tough, but I didn't know. So yeah, yeah. I always wonder why I got so dizzy. But then that thing about getting sleep is, is, is such a, a great thing to do, you know, mm. being forced into that. Um, in any event, so, um, oh wait, let's get back to the question. What was the question again? It, it was, do you have any non-musical superpowers? Oh, right. So I'm told I'm able to, to disappear at the drop of a hat, but what it is is that I think I first started getting that superpower when I was growing up and I didn't know I was deaf in one ear and I would hear someone say something which I thought was really interesting. But a lot of times I was actually hearing not what they said. And I realized that what people say is not as interesting as what I hear most of the time. <laughs> That's <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> yeah. So I just get really bored. You know, people That's are just great. talking and we talking away and I'll just stand up and leave the room and apparently nobody <laughs> notices. <laughs> oh my god because I'll, I'll 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 get refreshed or maybe i'll go sit by the fire i you know whatever five six minutes i'll just come back nobody realized i was gone so i have that superpower and i love it <laughs> that's awesome yeah oh my god that's phenomenal <laughs> well you know when you're playing music the best time is when you disappear so yeah in fact um you know amy ray of the indigo girls asked me once what's what's your best time on stage and I, you know, I thought for a few seconds and I said, you know, actually, I don't remember because the best times are when you disappear. And she just looked at me and she got that grin because she knows, Yeah. you know, it's like, you're not supposed to know. You're supposed to head towards that place Yeah. and, sure. and join in what is, you know, not your projection of, I want to be, you know, whatever, revered or loved or I'm a superstar or whatever. All that's good. All that's good, good, good. But. That disappearing thing is is the deal. Very and cool. you know, Lowell, I mean, he died in the seventies. He's still with me now. He's here at IMA. You know, we jam in our dreams. Um, when I was uh, working on chapter three, which I'm I'm actually reviewing right now of the audio book of Land of a Thousand mm -hmm. Bridges, I had to I had to just set down the script and pick up a guitar and do a. a um, uh, an unplugged version of the first song on the first Fanny album, which is Come and Hold Me, right then and there because Lowell insisted on it. And I'm so glad he did because it turned out really well and it works great under the narrative. So that disappear thing is kind of, you know, it's disappear, but it's not disappear. You know, it's I, I remember when I used to read, when I was in Fanny, I would read about Buddhism, you know, before enlightenment, the mountain, after enlightenment, the mountain, I would think, what does that mean? I mean, I just can't hang with this. You know, there's a, or everything is everything, which was a, actually a Diana Ross <laughs> first album. <laughs> I would see that on Sunset Strip, you know, on the bit, everything is everything. I go, that is so stupid, you know, <laughs> yet, and yet it's true, you know. 
not that I'm enlightened, but I've gone, yeah, I've had such great teachers that I, I know what that is. I know what, what that means, you know. Very cool. Do you have any hobbies? I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, what? sorry. No, no, it's all cool. Do you have any hobbies or interests outside of music? Oh, I read. I read voraciously. I love to read. Mo- mostly um, nonfiction, I read everything. development, I read everything. 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 I read spy novels. I, re- I love reading about uh, viruses and pandemics. I was going to be a doctor at some point. Um, uh, maybe even a surgeon, you know. It's, it's a good thing I went into music. But um, I'll read pretty much anything um, that the you know that grabs my interest. I I'm I'm I am obsessed with anything that has to do with World War II. I think maybe I had been uh, in combat somewhere or been a Jew who was running or something because I I read everything mm-hmm. I can about World War II anywhere in the world. It's cool that you're pretty um, connected with you know, feelings and thoughts you have, you know, I think you, you're pretty intense with that. And, and I think that allows you to feel comfortable with yourself, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm a seeker. I'm yeah. a seeker. And because I was so unhappy, I just, you know, and, and that's one of the reasons why I, I had to leave Fanny because I knew I had to figure out how to become a human being. How do you become a human being? How do I leave this place of desolation, which is what it felt like to me? You know, like, I mean, when I left Fanny, it was like I was on a, on a bad acid trip, you know, because there we were on the cusp of success and it should have been so great. And everything was as if dust or ash in my mouth. And I was so freaked out by that. I couldn't understand it. I was really thrown, um, really thrown by that. So, you know, there you have it. I, I really had to find out what is going on. What what is the nature of reality? And and Buddhism answers a lot of questions. Those questions without saying, "Hey, believe me." Yeah. I mean, many times I've heard uh, different lamas or even the Dalai Lama himself say, "Well, don't believe me." <laughs> I, it doesn't matter to me if you believe any of this. Go sit and find out for yourself what the nature of reality is. Yeah. You know, and I, I love that attitude because that is a full on challenge that is so real and so difficult <laughs> that it's hard to get through the first time. <laughs> well, it's like that old saying, if it's if it's if it's if it's meant to be, it's up to me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so yeah. I'm going to ask you. By one the way, I, I saw I saw a question. Uh, yeah. In, in your list that was about uh, who were the people whom. Uh, who influenced you that maybe no one yeah yeah let's talk about that yeah musically yeah, let's do yeah music so well i i thought about joe pass immediately interesting because i loved his tone and he was so clean and i wanted to play like him but i you know i couldn't but i listened to him obsessively in fact the the the, the year that um sunshine of your love came out which of course we had to learn and do it gigs um i was listening obsessively to to joe pass at the same time so you That's know wild. my mind you know was going in two different directions you know uh dean parks larry rittenauer um uh, there was a guy in new york who very very few people know or remember his name was hiram bullock yeah from and, he became the saturday night live well he but see nobody ever mentions hiram he was incredible i mean he first of all he was unafraid he could play anything, and his tone was really stellar. So, you know, those are some of the people who, who really influenced me. I'm going to ask you one more question, then we'll talk about uh, IMA. And I can't thank you enough. You're like really sweet, and I really appreciate your time, <laughs> and you've been so genuine. And and uh, and I told you well, before, you haven't seen the fr- fierce part of me yet. That well, well, I hope think. not. And you, ha- and, and you haven't fallen asleep, and you haven't disappeared. So I'm I'm gonna get out while I'm lucky here. Okay? That's <laughs> nice. Uh, what's been the biggest change in your personality over the last ten years, and has that change been intentional and deliberate, or is it just a natural part of aging? Huh. You know, there's so much about aging that's um, a challenge, you know. So I think surrendering to the natural changes has 
has had an effect on me. And, um, and, and, you know, everything I've learned in Buddhist practice, I try to put into use, but I, I don't really know how far I've overcome my, um, um, well, what would it say? What would I say about myself? I'm, Like, I like things to happen fast, and I like them to happen out of chaos, <laughs> because I'm an Aries. <laughs> <laughs> My wife's an Aries. Yeah, I, yeah, so... And, and you know what? I think you understand there's an impulsive quality to it, but there's also a very uh, kind of haughty thing, like you want it your way right now, you know? So I do try to work on that. I, I, I don't know how well I've succeeded. I know people still get mad at me, Um but the one thing I, I mean, the good thing about working with uh, girls in our rock and roll girls camps programs here at IMA is even though I alarm them sometimes, I think, because um, my energy is pretty fierce. I was just going to say, you're a force of energy. And <sighs> no, you, you, the thing is, if someone is not have that same energy, yeah. you, you, like I'm talking to you and I'm a pretty strong and you know I'm pretty high and I'm pretty strong personality, but I li- I like that because I'm like so now you know I I'm rising. You're forcing me to rise up. But if you're oh, yeah no I and I love that. But if you're talking to someone that's you know maybe either a little intimidated or yeah. uh, you know I could s- you, you'd be overwhelming because you are I mean you're like boom. You know, like I feel like you're here in the room with me. You know? I have been called the force of nature. No, but it's great. <laughs> she calls me that. <laughs> but that's great. I mean, shit, you got one life here, man. Just we bl- got one. bring that's it, what, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I'm impatient. And um, curbing that, I think, is one of my my uh, greatest challenges and, and goals. You know, but again, working with the girls at camp, once they realize that, okay, I might have my little flashes, but... I really care about them and I got their back and they, they can come back year after year. They can borrow equipment. They can call in the middle of the night. In other words, I've subsumed a lot of, you know, when you're a performer, it's all about me, 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 right? Hmm. Uh, You're projecting yourself. And as I get older, I think I like the fact that I'm able to not focus on myself all the time or realize that I am and am, is it a good thing, you know, in the moment, but I'm also able to see the bigger picture. And what I really want to do is help these young women and pass it on and do what I can to serve everybody, you know? So I do like that part that the fact that I've actually parsed that down to kind of a mantra, you know, how can I serve? I can't thank you enough. I want to, um, Let's talk about the IMA and talk about what does the organization do? What prompted you to start it in the first place? And you go. Um, in 1976, I was in Los Angeles at a meeting at Olivia Records, which may not be uh, a name that's that familiar to you, but it was a all women recording company. And in fact, um, Two women, Chris Williamson and Judy Lugas, just got a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Americana Awards in Nashville just a few days ago. Um, And I remember being at that meeting and I heard everything that was being said. You know, you got to remember, I didn't I wasn't really a feminist yet. I didn't know what that meant. I mean, all through Fanny, we knew that there was feminism, but we didn't know what that was. And when we got asked about it, we would say, well, we're not sure what it is, but we think that. We are because we're doing what we want to do, you know. So that was our boots on the ground um, experience of feminism. Now I get into the actual arena of women's music and I'm hearing these women, uh, get, you know, state their goals. And a lot of it was kind of pie in the sky when you're all excited about something. And I heard this voice in my head and it said, um, who's going to take care of all, who's really going to take care of all these young women who are, who are going to come up, come through? Ten years later, exactly in 1985, I heard more voices and they started to come into my dreams. And I was in San Francisco um, hanging out for a little bit with Angela Davis, whom, as you know, is uh, a a revolutionary (laughs) and incredibly smart. I mean, she's one of the most intelligent people I know. And I was telling her about hearing these voices and she turned to me and said, well, get going. I'm like, what? (laughs) 
I, I'm not an organizer. I can't do that. She said, well, June, they're talking to you. My sister's a, an attorney. I'll give you her number. Get started. And so that's what it is. It was an imperative as doing music in an all-girl band was an imperative for us. We had to do it. IMA needed to happen. And I just uh, I just heard the voices and followed orders. You know, unfortunately, my partner, Ann Hackler, um, when we got together, was running the Women's Center at Hampshire College. They grabbed her as soon as she um, graduated and said, OK, you're going to run the Women's Center. So she did, uh, agreed to start it with me. She always had an idea of um, starting a, a, an educational institution that would be a little bit not of the patriarchy, shall we say. And that's what it is. <laughs> you know, so we don't model ourselves on other colleges. Although we did steal the, the logo for, or we <laughs> borrowed the logo for, um, for uh, Amherst College and we put a flaming guitar on it. I'll send that to you. We have there a logo that's a flaming guitar in the middle. And one of the world's top Latin scholars, um, we contacted her. She actually has passed away since, but she translated um, Seek the Truth, Rock the Boat for us into perfect latin so we have a logo it's the miss millington school of whatever it's you know it's seek really fantastic truth, it would actually be on the pajamas yeah yeah, seek the truth yeah. i like that yeah so i may had to be i may had to be because there's just there are too many young women and it, this is the time you know so it predated the me too movement right it's 1986 was yeah. when we actually really got going and we got a couple of people other people on the um founding board for example roma baron are you familiar with her name no i'm not do you, do you know laurie anderson right oh superman and all those yeah of course yeah. another yeah. new york it was, yeah, what is well, she lou reed's is her recording engineer slash producer okay she did all those his i think she's as important as thomas dolby but of course she doesn't get the uh you know the credit anyway so I just kind of went around and told everybody about this idea. And most people said, you know, I don't think you can pull this off. It's it's too much. It's too big. I mean, how are you going to do this? But you know what? We just started small. And like my dad said, do it in manageable chunks. You know? So I'd get a recording studio to give a couple hours for a workshop. So we would tell women and whoever, oh, go to, go to this. So it started out very humble like that. And then we got mm -hmm. a couple of grants and... So that was from 86 to um, 2001. We actually just planted the seed. We watered it. We, you know, made sure it had enough sun. We, that's what women do. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yes. In fact, Anne has a uh, TEDx talk um, that's really wonderful about leading from the kitchen because we, we, within the first few years, we got out of this idea of, we're trying to control this. It's going to be our school. It's going to be our idea. And then we realize we have to bend. We have to nurture this thing. We have to let, you know, the world, let it tell us what needs to be done. And then we'll, we'll follow that. You know, we'll, we'll do that. And that's really our cradle and it really has worked out. And it's amazing because here we have, you know, by 2001, we were able to, to buy this land uh, outside of Northampton, Massachusetts. It's 25 acres, a house and two barns. One of the barns was converted into performance center with uh, two recording studios. And let me tell you this. Here's a nice, nice tie-in with Fanny. After we started it, somewhere within the first five or six years, I get an email from someone, this guy, Bob Riegler. But I didn't remember the name. And he says, he writes in an email, uh, which I just happened to open, would you ever be interested in, in a house being donated to IMA? I'm like, I thought it was a scam, right? But I did reply. I said, well, who are you? He said, well, I used to hang out with you at Fanny Hill. And uh, there was one concert we went to where Stevie Wonder opened for the Rolling Stones. And they played your song, Think About the Children, over the PA during the wow. South. And I'm like, okay, there's only one person who knows that. And it's this guy. Well, I didn't know he was sick. And, and just after we moved here, which was maybe, again, another five years later, he came and visited once. He didn't tell us he was sick. A couple months later, he died and left us his house. So the barn, the first retro fit of the barn to make it safe and put in electricity the way we need and heat for the winter, radiant heat, came from his house. That's from really cool. From the universe, 
how did he remember me and find me? And I opened up that email. So, you know, being open and being in surrender to what is actually supposed to happen is the key to I man. That's what we're doing for women and young girls. You know, we're passing on. That's why I teach the four mothers. How hard was it for Ella Fitzgerald to go on the road and all, you know, all the people in Motown who couldn't just stop at a restaurant or buy gas, mm. you know, at a gas station. They, they could be killed just for trying to, to get something to eat. So, and they almost right. were. You look at Mavis Staples. That's exactly right. You know, you know? and um, another person on our uh, advisory board, Christine Allman, told me a story that Dion DeMucci told her once. Mm-hmm. You know who Dion is, yeah, right? Yeah, and I know Christine because she's the one who introduced me to you. That is so great. That is right. Well, <laughs> I don't know if she ever told you this story. So many people are swirling around in my head right now. But Dion told her this story where he's on the bus with one of those Motown reviews or similar and, of course, they couldn't stop at restaurants. So he said, okay, uh, let me off. Everybody give me their order. Let me off, and I'll, I'll, I'll go in the restaurant, you know, this diner, and, and get us the food. And the next thing you know, he's running out the door of that uh, diner with the owner firing a shotgun at him and, and all the food sp- spilling, uh, spilling on the ground because that guy realized he was getting food for the black people on the bus. Holy crap. Yeah, yeah. So this is not this is not just some, you know, uh, untraceable anecdote or something. It's true. It's true. So anyway, that's what I pass on to the girls to tell them, you know, a lot of people put their lives in their hands so that they could do music. And now you're benefiting from it. You know, I want you to appreciate it, appreciate that. And I want you to realize that there is actual a path that we're all on together. And by the way, you own this place. I tell them that. At orientation, the first day I uh, and the first day I teach, because when they look at the walls of the barn at IMA, it's their walls because they're inheriting this place. We're not holding on to it, you know. We actually already have two generations of people who have agreed to, or want to, or have have gotten the message that they're going to carry on. So they're going to run this place, and so on. You know, Um, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. And, and what kind of, I know you have camp there. What kind of stuff do you provide for a lot of these young girls? Well, number one, you open the door to the barn and it's just filled with all sorts of equipment. Everything's there. Um, and they sleep at our place because we own it. So we, we built two bunk, uh, we built a bunkhouse to the barn mm-hmm. and in addition to the barn. It's right by the studios. We have two um, uh, bathrooms that we built that are handicap accessible and have showers. So the girls are, you know, have a place to take care of themselves. And we have two yurts that were built out by the barn. So, and the food is cooked on site and nobody's allowed to just drop by when, when camps are happening. Now, those are the only programs in which only girls and women are allowed during the camp, but anybody can come to their shows. Anybody to come can come to any show or workshop or anything that's, that's going on. We've got some amazing workshops here. We have great shows coming up this fall. Um, so it's an ongoing uh, program of just doing what we can to help all the time. Are you ha- um, are you happy? I am happy. Good. That's I all am I, happy. That's all that yeah. counts. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, you know it's always a struggle because you're always fundraising. You're always trying to figure out how to put it all together. But it's so satisfying, and I know that I was I'm doing what I was put on this earth to do. You know, and that's incredibly. I mean, full circle. And let's talk about your bio, The Land of a Thousand Bridges, which um, I would encourage everybody to check it out and go to IMA.org, buy the biography, and 100% of the profits go to IMA.org in addition to check out the organization. And if you're into it, make a donation as well. But talk about Land of a Thousand Bridges. Yeah. Na, 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 na. <laughs> well, you know, that song was so, uh, you know, seminal and so important to us because that's right around the time that we realized that we had the power to get people to dance, to move. And it, it was because we were aided by those great dance songs, Midnight Hour. Oh, my gosh. You know, so when I started to write the book and I think I made my first stab in 1988. I even interviewed my high school English teacher, Mrs. Morrissey. I mean, I really, really got into it. It took me a long time. Back in California. I, mm-hmm. Yeah. And it took us 10 years. Me, believe it or not, it took us 10 years, me and everybody who had been in the Spelts and Fanny. And it's quite a parade 
of, of young women who were, we were involved in a lot of adventures. Um, you know, we covered how hard it was, but there's also a lot of fun because we were a pack. We were a gang. And that's what happens here at our camps, by the way. We get bands who start out of here and they get that same feeling, you know. Um, but it took us 10 years to figure out the timeline of when we all met, who was playing when and all that. Finally, I just said, well, geez, when was your first child born? When did you get married? <laughs> it was tough because it was one big ball of just like this experience that you're that we were making up you couldn't go to berkeley you couldn't call ima you could sure. you know um so uh, the only uh, programs that uh, is are only girls or the rock and roll girls camps every single other one is is open to everyone you know and there's some workshops that have been done here that... oh boys boys and girls oh yeah oh okay oh sure sure um, there have been some workshops here that, you know, for example, the rhythm section of uh, Lake Street Dive. Are you familiar with that band? No, I'm not. Oh, God. All right. So you got to check them out because they're... Lake Street yeah. Dive? <laughs> three three words, yeah. Um, so the rhythm section uh, is a woman on bass, a Bridget, and a guy on um, on drums. And I'm trying to think of his name. That's ridiculous, but... Um, anyway, they came and did, they did a workshop uh, on, you know, the beat, the groove. I, I think they called it the groove. Um, so that's an example of a, of a mixed workshop. And we have a jazz show coming up uh, in October that's brought in by a group called Jazz Shares in, in the area. Uh, they bring in great jazz uh, bands and music, ensembles. So like that, it's really amazing. It's really amazing. Anything we can do to share, we do it. And when people walk into the barn and they feel the – I've had people who've been playing professionally for you know, 30, 40, 50 years get tears in their eyes and say, if only I'd had a place like this when I was younger. Yeah. You know, it would have helped so much. And I call it the magical queendom. The magical queendom. I like that. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's another thing you can put on the back of your pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Hey, t what's the uh, – coolest or weirdest story in land of a thousand bridges that people will read or most unusual or interesting uh, huh wow that is a heck of a question well a cool a super cool story for me i i, I told you about how uh Cher wanted to meet us when we played on the sunday Cher show but when we recorded um the third a Fanny album, which was Fanny Hill, and it was produced by Richard Perry again, and uh, we worked with Jeff Emmerich at Apple Studio. Yeah, why do you know, I know that name? Jeff Emmerich? Because yeah. he did all the Beatles. Okay. <laughs> G-E-O-F-F, -F, correct? Yeah. yeah. See, that's what that was a good thing that used to come out of like album covers, man. Yeah. Because I'd read yeah. all this and I'd be like, you know, you get an education of who's like sort of who. And right. You don't read CD covers, and now digital, you do nothing. Yeah, yeah. So go ahead, Jeff Emmerich. I apologize. Yeah, Jeff Emmerich. And so we um, we're doing the song "Hey Bulldog," and um, which we had. I mean, the thing, the great thing about the Svelts and Fanny was that, you know, when the Svelts went to Hollywood, we could already play. When we got to Apple, we knew how to play and record. And you should have seen Jeff and his assistants' eyes light up when they realized that this all girl band who came in was, man, we were ready to go, you know, and their eyes just lit up. They were so happy. Um, anyway, so we had already rehearsed Hey Bulldog. We played it at gigs. Um, we knew the arrangement. We knew what we wanted to do, but what Richard wanted to do was bring in strings. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure that's where I met Paul Buckmaster. But what I do remember is that, it was the first string session I ever really watched and it was our string session. And he had members of the uh, uh, London Philharmonic, um, quite a few of them, by the way, they filled the room. That's cool. And man, when I heard that coming back through the speakers, uh, Paul Buckmaster arrangement, I mean, boom, 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 digga, 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 boom, 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 you know, and there was a, a uh, ascending line ascending arpeggio on the on the choruses that if we get to play it live now i do that line on on um, 
kind of a souped up guitar sound, but it's and our so you can talk to me and the do go 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 it just keeps going and it's just I mean I was in I was overtaken I was overtaken just the the sound of it and the it was the right part the purity of it that was actually one of the best moments of my life that's really cool and thank you for sharing that sure everybody check out. June Millington's bio. It's called Land of a Thousand Bridges. And you're writing a part two of it now, right? I am. It starts in 1975 when rock and roll collides with feminism, spirituality, and women's music. It's going to be called Force of Nature. (laughs) (laughs) I think that's a good title. Yeah, yeah. Or well, forces of nature. Forces of nature. Well, I want to thank June Millington because you are a force of nature. You're very <laughs> sweet. Thank you so much for being so open and for sharing. And uh, I really appreciate your time. Uh, everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this interview, please share it with your friends on social media. We appreciate your support. Thanks again to June Millington for spending time with us. And please check out the IMA Institute for Musical Arts at IMA.org and check out June's book, Land of a Thousand Bridges. And uh, go to the homepage of everyonelovesguitar.com. Sign up to get on our newsletter list. And most important, remember that happiness is a choice, so choose wisely. Be nice, go play your guitar, and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I'm out. We hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, subscribe to the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, and you can do this online at everyonelovesguitar.com or on iTunes. And if you like the show, please leave us a five-star positive review. The more five-star reviews we get, the higher our show ranks, and higher rankings mean we get to continue speaking with cool, interesting guests on our show. We'll see you on the next episode, and until then, keep playing your guitar and have fun making music. 